Hey everybody, my name is Antonio Diaz and I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Life and Time. Thank you so much for tuning in today, um, wherever you are in the world. We have a really exciting and fun webinar planned for you uh, uh, for today. And um, just to kind of let you know real quick, uh, these webinars are completely free and they're made possible through the support of our Life and Time members. So if you, if you enjoy you know, today's webinar, feel free to consider joining us at lifeintime.com. Um, these are completely free, free education and just having a good time, just being able to connect. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague and our senior editor at Life and Time, Steph Ferrari, who's going to host today's panel and webinar, and uh, I'll have her take it from here. Take it away, Steph. Well, ciao to everyone out there and everyone who has decided to join us for this uh, this particular webinar today. I'm really excited. We, um, we are broadcasting from a, a number of different places in the world today um, and believe it or not 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 in Italy um, but that's kind of the point here is that we are not uh, we are not in Italy uh, at least the the five of us on on this particular call right now um, and the the goal of this session is to figure out um, how to live a more Italian lifestyle uh, when you can't actually be there we are obviously all at a point in life right now in this in this year and in this particular moment where travel is not uh, really possible for most people. And um, this is something that I have wanted to do for a while because I personally have spent, uh, uh, I have family in Italy. I grew up uh, in an Italian family and a few years ago, uh, a good amount of time there visiting family every couple of months, I would go and spend a couple of weeks and I would instantly have this transformative lifestyle um, and start feeling, you know, this just wonderful different uh, difference in myself. And um, the trip would end and inevitably, you know, you go back to your to your life and sort of pick up where you left off. But I would always come home and try to think, what can I maintain from from that time spent there? Um, and bring home and sort of practice a little bit more uh, in my own daily life. And fortunately, I'm not alone in, in, in enjoying the culture. That's why we have the Negroni explosion of the last few years and, and things like that. Um, but in terms of, it, you know, this year, obviously not being able to get over there and, uh, and really kind of wanting to continue to enjoy and appreciate some of those things, um, we have invited some really amazing experts uh, in Italian culture here to, to help us guide how we might be able to transform our, our lives here a little bit, um, even if it's just pulling a, a, a principle or two or an ideal or two from Italian culture. Um, so I'm going to let our guests introduce themselves and then we'll dive into a conversation about how to live a more Italian lifestyle at home, wherever you may be. Um, so uh, why don't we start with you, uh, Allie? Hi, I'm Ali Loria. I'm a Bay Area based chef and my focuses are on fresh pasta, organic farming and winemaking. And Vicky, do you wanna tell us where you're calling from? And, and also, um, also if I could ask just sort of what your connection to Italian culture is. So maybe Ali, if we could go back to you and then. Sure. Um, I like to think that I mastered the um, getting the Italian lifestyle in Italy and, you know, living in New York City, I decided to make the change and um, create that lifestyle for myself out in Northern California. Beautiful. And Vicki. Um, so my name is Vicki Benison. Um, I'm the creator of a YouTube channel called Pasta Grannies. It's also a cookery book. Um, and I've interviewed over 300 elderly Italian signore um, all over Italy. Um, so my perspective is um, as an observer of Italian culture, a particular segment, this, this age group of uh, women, primarily who've actually were born just before the Second World War. So they've seen a lot of change. Incredible. I can't wait to discuss pasta in greater detail. Uh, Danielle, do you want to? Give us an intro. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Steph. Great to be here with everyone. Um, I am an assistant professor of Italian at Dartmouth College, and I have a PhD in Italian studies. I lived in Italy for years and go back um, for research and life frequently. And um, my work is mostly on uh, medieval Italy and food culture during that time, but uh, I expand that into the modern and contemporary period um, for conversations like this and to be less boring in front of mixed audiences. So. <laughs> I, for one, will never be bored by your studies and the work that you do. Um, so, and we'll, and we'll definitely get into that uh, in more detail. Um, Ali, I want to start with you because uh, in, in the spirit of this particular webinar, we have had some conversations and it sounds like that ha that idea of sort of visiting Italy and then bringing, bringing the culture home and, and li living it more uh, in your life here in the States has resonated with you. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that and how that's, how that's worked for you? Yeah, um, I grew up in New Jersey in an Italian American family and I think I had all of these ideas of what Italian culture was and also coming from a food family, my dream was always to open up my own restaurant and I worked in restaurants until I was 30 and then opened my own and you know something was still missing and you know throughout my 20s I would go to Italy once a year. Um, I never went as a kid, but as soon as I was able to, you know, work to buy a flight myself, I, I traveled every year um, to a different region. And I realized, you know, living in New York, I, I felt like I needed to go to Italy in order to be inspired um, by the food, the wine, the culture, the lifestyle. And um, you know, after I had my restaurant. I not being fulfilled in the way that I'd always hoped, I realized I can, I need to do this for myself. I need to find what I love so much about Italy um, every day. And I moved to Sonoma County. I left my life in New York City and I worked a wine harvest and got a bike, a bicycle, um, and just fully immersed myself in California's agriculture. And it was a huge missing piece um, to my food career, my food lifestyle. Um, and yeah, now, now I focus, my priorities have shifted. And as long as my values align with work, with the people in my life, um, that's, that, that's the balance I was always hoping for and what I felt in Italy. And, and now I have it here in California. So that connection to ingredients is such an important part of uh, of Italian culture, I find. Um, and I wanted to uh, talk to Vicky a little bit about that in terms of um, what you've seen in your research and how uh, the grannies that you've worked with over the years approach their selection of ingredients and, and their relationship to sort of seasonality and frugality and um, what those principles look like and, the, and how we can adopt them. So I've been filming um, elderly women um, make pasta by hand, um, so fresh pasta, um, because I noticed that in fact it was only the over 65 year olds who were doing that on a daily basis. And that younger generations of women are too busy going out to work to actually do that. And, and if people are making pasta, it's a matter of choice, which is great. Um, I think there is this tendency to see um, Italian a history and culture in a very romantic way. And in mm. fact, for these women, um, uh, it was always a matter of survival and making do with what you had. And it so happens that with the soil and the sunshine, what they had is fantastic. Um, so with these women, they are using ingredients and um, wheat um, that's in their immediate vicinity. Um, they're not thinking about um, down the road in Tuscany if they live in Liguria. Um, they're, they're very, very hyper-local. Um, and that is the joy for us, of course. Um, so that has actually sort of given rise from the past perspective of this incredible diversity of shapes and names, and it's all designed to confuse the outsider. Um, uh, you know, all these, it's like 
you're calling it what now? <laughs> You've just moved one village away, you know. Um, and so um, uh, picking up on that, it's, it's like you have to... Um, you've grown your beans or you've grown your tomatoes and you've got this wonderful window and then it has, there is not only making the pasta, but there's also making the um, estratu or there is making your passata. And, and the thing for me is just coming off the ingredients is this whole idea of community and friends mucking in and family mucking in to actually bottle those tomatoes um, to make those complicated pasta shapes. There's, there's sort of um, a very, um, different dynamic, I think, to what, certainly what is um, uh, the case here in the UK. And during lockdown, I think a lot of people were discovering um, that actually they could now have the time to make pasta. I mean, my channel actually had a 60% increase in viewing figures um, during lockdown. So as everybody kind of go, yeah, let's make pasta. <laughs> wow, that's really interesting. I feel like, it, you know, that's, that, it's that, there's been this tendency to really try to do things that, you know, like bake bread or um, things that are so steeped in tradition that we haven't really done um, in the past. And on the subject of tradition, Danielle, I'm wondering if maybe you can kind of give us a little bit of background on how Italian tradition has developed in terms of food. Yeah, of course. Um, well, it's funny because as Vicky was talking, it's reminding me of a, an idea that I was um, trying to articulate uh, about the um, connection to resources in a kind of wider lens uh, recently, um, because I think, uh, Steph, you and I were talking about the um, kind of transversalism of, of these, uh, of, of this relationship to resources, right? And uh, not just in food, but in agriculture more broadly. And the fact that Italy um, is, as Vicky was mentioning, very rich in um, the kind of diversity and uh, profundity of food products, um, but contrasted by the fact that it is not rich in other resources, right? Mm -hmm. um, Italy is a place where uh, almost everything else is scarce or non-existent. Um, the fastest way most people learn about this is when they rent their own flat for the first time and pay the gas bill and uh, find out how expensive it is to import all of your energy, right? Which is what most Italians uh, are experiencing. So when it comes to the relationship with food, um, we can say that things like pasta uh, there and many other ingredients that we associate with a, um, a hyper Italian tradition or a, a, a distinctly Italian identity maybe don't have as long a history as we uh, would like to think or even the Italians themselves would like to think because pasta only really becomes a popular everyday thing to eat in the, across the peninsula in the you know mid 20th century really or in any case certainly um, not before the 19th century um, but the fact that uh, you appreciate and make the most of the of the richness of those resources on the other hand is something that's quite uh, quite old indeed, right? And the uh, understanding of uh, using well what you have and uh, connecting to the uh, roots of your community through those products uh, is something that uh, certainly uh, predates Italy as a, as a country and, and probably even Italy uh, uh, or Italian as a language. Yeah, and I think that's so relevant right now, you know, uh, as we're, uh, we're all kind of trying to make the most of a lot of things, whether that's, you know, time together or food that we have. Um, Ali, I'm wondering if maybe you could speak a little bit on the culinary side uh, to people at home who are looking to sort of stretch resources right now, and how that looks in terms of it, through the Italian lens uh, of cooking. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have the space um, to have a little garden outside, um, and that's a really nice way to start to understand what grows where you are and what grows well together, um, and I'm a big believer in what grows together goes together, and that I learned in Italy, um, but if you don't have access to that, then a farmer's market is a, an amazing way to see what's in season and um, also utilizing the whole fruit, the whole vegetable is really important. And 
um, doing some research on the ingredient and, and the different uses um, and utilizing in different dishes and also just in the same dish. Um, that's, that's something that I've also learned um, while traveling and just seeing like how versatile spinach is in Italy that I've never seen in, in America ever. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because I went, uh, I, I had a, uh, the opportunity to have Easter dinner uh, in Italy last year and artichokes were in season. And I went to a ho the home of a, a, a family friend and she cooked dinner and, and we had artichoke lasagna and then we had artichoke in, you know, roasted artichoke. And then we had, we had it like eight ways. And at the end of the meal, I was like, at home, people would be saying, oh, well, we, we, did that for the first course we're not going to do it again you know um but it's a very different way of looking at it how do you keep that exciting um gosh i i think i i've been lucky enough to to go to certain places like in um in december my fiance and i went to sicily thankfully right before everything closed up um and had those experiences. And I think because it was just before quarantine, it was really amazing inspiration for me to say, I have an abundance of arugula. How can I put this into every single dish without it being boring? And that's just, that's trial and error. That's it, just experimenting and getting creative. And you know, it helps push me as a chef um, to keep me on my toes. And it's, it seems really simple and something that could easily be overlooked, but to be sustainable and um, have integrity, it's just, it's just trial, trial. And um, <clears throat> it's really also, exciting when it does work. Sorry to interrupt you. No worries. <laughs> but, but I think also um, don't punish yourself in trying to get a diversity going because what, what, uh, you know, you will have your three beans or your one type of, of artichoke growing in that area and, and they, they will become experts on that. Um, and they won't be worried about, you know, the whatever it is down in Basilicata, you know, they're in Duya or, or uh, you know, so that's sort of, it's, it's sort of like one thing at a time. Um, <laughs> you know, because, don't feel that you have to cover the peninsula. Um, because whenever I show my grannies, you know, a video of someone from making pasta from, you know, sometimes just down the road and they kind of go, no, we don't do that. <laughs> um, it's just, you know, the sort of two or three pastas that they, they master and they're absolutely brilliant at it. They don't feel it, the need to actually, you know, do all those different styles of pasta. I appreciate that. <laughs> Yeah, and I think again, you know, I think people are uh, buying CSAs and doing they're buying CSAs and doing things like that right now, and they're getting an abundance of one particular thing, and it's like, how do you keep it interesting? Um, and I think that that's that's a, a something that is a, a very, very Italian sort of way is to 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 really just appreciate what there is and and find new new combinations and new ways and and have that be experimental and fun too. Um, and I think that to me is always something really enjoyable to do with other people. Um, and Vicki, you, you had touched on the importance of community in your work and how you found. So, you know, when we talk about Italian eating, we talk about cooking, certainly. Um, but, you know, part of the eating experience in Italy has less to do with the actual food in front of you than, than the people yeah. around you in the community, um, in my experience. So Vicki, if, if you don't mind talking to that point a little bit, I would love to hear it. Um, so people sit down for a meal. Everybody sits down as a family. People, a lot of people still go home for lunch. Um, and certainly Sunday lunch is always with a family and there's always sort of large numbers of family. Um, so there's none of this grazing um, that you get, uh, certainly, you know, I'm talking here in Britain, um, that you get, you know, everybody's sort of doing their own diets, uh, their own preferences, uh, they're eating at different times, you know, there's none of that. Everybody sits down and eats and it's about, you know, the community, the sharing. And also when we're kind of filming, it's half the village is behind the camera. I mean, that, that no one's doing mm -hmm. this in isolation. Everybody's kind of coming together to enjoy the experience and to join in if they can. And that's very, very Italian, very important. And, I, and we were in, 
I was also in Sicily, um, Ali, and the, the uh, 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 filming Estratu, so tomato paste, and you know the neighbors were kind of leaning out the balcony, and then they kind of came around and said, you know, can can I help? And it was sort of unabashed nosiness, but they were still kind of there and enjoying it. So <laughs> that's what you got to do. So to get your friends to come, you know, come round and and make that meal with you. <laughs> and Danielle, you had talked a, a little bit. We've talked about the your your um, your perspective and your understanding on the sort of urban to rural trends. And when we talk about community um, and the tendencies around eating, what does that look like uh, in various parts of Italy or in in sort of different different part different you know uh, ecosystems, I guess. Yeah, well, I think it, you know, it's interesting when um, hearing, um, well, I guess, you know, to speak to the entire point that we're getting to here, the idea that uh, from a, an American view or a UK view, that Italians are always sort of living better, enjoying life more, um, eating better, no question, drinking in a, a healthier and more fulfilling fashion, every part of it. Um, but of course, the reality is that, um, like any other, um, developed economy, they're moving farther and farther away from that as we speak, right? And um, all the more so in a moment like this where um, uh, econo uh, even more severe economic downturn, which is saying something because the economy was already sluggish and, and uh, very challenging for anyone under 40, um, now uh, about to become worse, um, is a time when you will uh, see those kinds of traditions and comforts challenged because uh, people will accept any work they can get. They'll move farther away from home than they might have before. Um, they will not be uh, able to enjoy the um, the kinds of the elements of a lifestyle that uh, are considered to be um, in initially in an Italian context um, necessary, not just privileges, right, but um, but part of a, a complete life. Um, when it comes to uh, the difference between city versus rural, I think a lot of um, you know what Vicky's talking about with people coming out and being part of those things. And I think Ali mentioned it before. You know, the the luxury of having an outdoor space and having some room to work with the products that you have uh, is you know a significant uh, distinction, right? If you are a young person um, fresh out of university in Italy today, you're probably going to be moving if you haven't already to an urban center like Milan, and not, maybe only Milan now is one of the few places where you'd find new employment. And uh, you would be far from your family, probably. Um, you probably can't go home for lunch. You probably share an apartment with maybe even several other people in order to make ends meet. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that um, there is in the urban to uh, rural or the urban to suburban uh, distinction, uh, also uh, some nostalgia within Italy for what Italy once was or could be, right? So that even Italians, are imagining the things that um, we also imagine Italy to be, even as they are there and a part of that culture. So the appreciation continues, but the ability to practice that reality becomes increasingly uh, difficult in, in moments of crisis like this, um, but also as the world moves towards uh, a more uh, kind of unforgiving uh, structure, uh, economically speaking. And I think, you know, I, that, I also go ahead. Remember, Vicky. sorry, sorry. No, no, please. Just, go ahead. We, we went into national lockdown in Italy because everybody was getting on the train to go home down south. Right. So exactly, they were going right. to spend it with their, they were going to spend it with their parents and their family. Um, right. So, yeah, a, a reminder of how, of, right, of, of those, of mass internal migration, right, that, um, uh, that predicated the, the, um, the growth of the mass tourism industry that exists now as well, and, and all the uh, access that we have um, in terms of the idea of Italian food culture um, beyond the peninsula because of uh, the dispersion of people, the, the diaspora that began in the, um, in, the, in the late 1800s. It seems like it's an interesting time with so much change happening within Italy that uh, we're sort of almost preserving some of the traditions outside of Italy now um, in in the sense in the work that someone like Ali does which is you know creating uh, 
a pasta culture, you know, in Northern California based on, you know, Italian tradition, um, even as Italian tradition is evolving within the actual country. Um, Ali created this, uh, you know, very incredible and extremely useful guide for the life and time uh, home edition. Um, and I'm curious, Ali, if, you know, how you see people at home now being able to sort of tap into those um, those traditions and 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 bringing that community aspect into it because pasta making is not an easy thing. It's not easy. Um, I think the what this pandemic has offered us is time, um, and it's time to recenter and focus on what we might have been missing or um, just to kind of connect deeper to things that we care about or we really enjoy and taking restaurants away from us in the US and you're forced to learn how to make bread if you went to a bakery every week to get a fresh loaf. And same goes for pasta. And it's also you know, it's a it's an amazing craft to learn how to do, and it's something that is really affordable to learn how to make. And I I'm, I was so happy to share that guide, and I'm I'm self taught with pasta, and it was something that I had always loved as a kid growing up, but my family didn't have um, like the pasta culture other than like eating big bowls of pasta, um, so. Pasta for me was the way that I really connected with Italian food. And it's also the perfect vessel to experiment with whatever local produce or, or meats that you might have. So I, I think, I think it's an amazing, um, it's an amazing craft to experiment with and also have a better appreciation for, for the pasta grannies out there, for the pasta chefs, the, the cooks that are, rolling out the annuloti by hand and the next time you are at a restaurant and you see a, a bowl um i think the there's going to be a greater appreciation for it yeah and i'd love to um follow that up with with vicky um in terms of using there's there's always the debate about you know what pastas go with what ingredients what sauces what the pairings should be um and how they're extremely contingent on regionality. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how people at home might be able to sort of adopt some of that into their own life based on what you've seen out there in your work? Yes, I think um, the rules can sometimes be invented by journalists. Hmm. I think you'll find, I get really annoyed by people saying the six things you're doing wrong with your pasta. It's like, come on, you know, relax a little about this because you'll you'll have a rule apparently which says you shouldn't put a ragu with uh, tagliolini which are kind of angel hair pasta well in Lazio there's a village that does just that um and you know you shouldn't put chicken with pasta well yeah actually they do um in certain circumstances so um you know there's always a Italian uh, I, this is going to be a gross generalization but the, you know the, they'll find a way and they won't necessarily they they don't get the memo about those rules and they're doing what their parents have taught them what their community does and um, so when it comes to rules about pasta it's kind of obvious because pasta started off actually and certainly in the north with egg pasta is is, is like in a soup and then so the the whole kind of development out of soup and onto a plate with the condimento is actually something which has happened, you know, in the, in the last century. You'll correct me um, on that. Um, I, you'll know much more than that, uh, me <laughs> on that one. But no, so I, I think it's about using common, common sense with your pasta. If it's a fine and beautiful pasta, it doesn't need, on the whole, it, you know, it, uh, gravy juices, for example, the tangerine in Piemonte, you know, it's, it's beautiful with your leftover gravy. Um, and so the sort of more robust uh, pastas that you get down in Southern Italy, you know, your macaroni type ones, your cav um, cavatelli, they suit the more vegetably um, style um, that perhaps Ali makes, um, you know, that sort of the, the, the semolina, the durum wheat flour pastas uh, shapes that you can make. 
I'm, I'm straying into the different types of dough here, but anyway, um, so yeah. Um, do what you think is sensible. And if it doesn't work, then you realize that you've probably broken one of those rules and you're gonna have to try again, something different the next time. <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> Don't be intimidated with that. <laughs> And, you know, I, I, I do actually would love to doughs and like that because thinking about use in terms of drying, dried pastas, fresh pastas. Um, Allie, maybe you could speak to that a little bit. You cut out a little bit, so I wasn't. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you, can you, technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was uh, I was posing the question in terms of to sort of demystify a little bit for people at home the different types of doughs, um, you know, maybe what is especially useful in the home. I find myself doing a lot of flour and water. My, I grew up in a family that uses an egg a lot more than I do personally. Um, and I'm just curious if you have any thoughts or suggestions for folks at home on on what those various types are and maybe what they're better for. Yeah, um, I, I teach quite a few pasta classes and um, my usually the beginner class is just flour and water. Um, I think that's a really nice way to start to understand what pasta dough should and could feel like. Um, and I use, I use it usually a 50-50 combination of um, semolina flour and all-purpose flour. Um, it can go, and then I usually, after you can master that dough, then I tell my students to slowly take away the all-purpose flour and mm -hmm. then start to build up to the semolina. And I just think it, they're really versatile. Um, you, can, you can make a lot with that dough. And um, to Vicky's point, there are a lot of rules and I've seen them debunked in Italy. Um, the U.S. makes a lot of rules, um, and I do think that the media likes to to make them up to have new content. So I'm all about trial and error. What you have in your fridge, what you need to go through. That, like I said before, pasta is a perfect vessel to pretty much carry anything. I love that we're having this conversation about uh, you know sort of breaking the rules um, because I think people get really caught up in that. And um, you know, Vicky, you you had said something along the lines of relax a little. And I think that that's, that to me is, is so indicative of the, of the culture. Um, Danielle, I'm wondering if maybe you could kind of, in terms of the actual sort of daily living of Italians, maybe you could give us a little bit of insights, you know, based on your experience in living in Italy, what, what does it look like for, you know, what's, what's a day in the life of an Italian in terms of like food and drink? Uh, well, you know, I think that um, we're talking gross generalization, so I'll stick sure. with that. But in any case, <laughs> um, um, I'll say that um, to pick up on what um, you know, I think Vicky mentioned before, um, the the fact of not only the rules being made to be broken, but also that um, many of these traditions are relatively recent on a longer term scale. Um, Pasta is not something that most Italians were eating um, 100 years ago, give or take. We're getting we're getting to the point where even in my life, I have to start expanding my um, chronology because I mm. used to say 100 years ago and think I meant like the end of the 1800s, but that's not the case anymore. But anyway, um, um, the uh, the day-to-day uh, -day relationship with pasta in Italy right now, certainly, and any time after, I would say, the post-war boom economico, when um, people began to have more disposable income and comfort, um, was uh, actually one that is strongly connected to the older generation, uh, in part because if you had money, you didn't want to eat a lot of pasta, right? Pasta is a filler, and um, so you would be leaning towards uh, both uh, a higher protein diet and uh, less time at the table in general, slowly, slowly over time. Um, but, uh, you know, so if you look, so I live, when I'm in Italy, I usually live in Florence um, and a, a woman my age in Florence who goes to, you know, kind of like average office job, wakes up in the morning, probably has a, a 
coffee with milk in it in some form. I don't, I don't like um, any milky coffee. Um, but you know, your cappuccino, you have a brioche, you don't eat again at all until uh, a time that for an American would seem late for lunch, between one and two, maybe. Um, you might have some pasta at that time. You probably don't have pasta for dinner um, unless you're having a complete meal, meaning um, multi-course meal, maybe with guests. Um, and uh, you, there may be one of the biggest distinctions that um, I, I'll bring up because I think it'll let us segue nicely into aperitivo is that uh, snacking is sort of traditionally considered childish, right? Um, you are asking for um, ter food, things about food or terms of food or, or sayings about food in Italian that are different from uh, American. And the word for snack or the most common word for snack in Italian is merendina, right? And merendina is for babies. Um, a merendina is for little kids who come home for school and can't wait until dinner because their children and their metabolisms are too fast and they're burning energy all the time. Adults don't have snacks, right? Adults wait until they sit down and eat a meal. Um, and that, uh, it's also something that's changing right now, largely because of aperitivo culture and the kind of socialization factor that has come in to that uh, that sphere there also. Yeah. So is, is aperitivo culture, is that relatively, when did that start? How did that emerge? Does anybody have insight into that, Danielle, maybe? or? Well, I can start. I'm sure everybody has uh, plenty to say about it, but it's, yes, the, the short answer is quite recently. And I mean, I can remember, this is, uh, all my friends have heard me tell the story a million times, which is once I was with some friends in um, Sorrento and uh, we were having lunch, a weekend lunch, which meant we weren't gonna eat until three probably. And we weren't gonna get up from the table until midnight when I was um, uh, going to be, you know, quite exhausted. And I, uh, you know, it was a beautiful afternoon and I said, oh, because we won't be having lunch for a little while, why don't we stop for an aperitivo? Meaning, um, it, you know, at that point, probably like a campari or like vermouth something on ice just to open up the stomach like aperitif is meant to do. Uh, and I was mercilessly made fun of because um, it, it profoundly revealed how little I knew about the South at the time, right? Um, no one would suggest having an aperitivo. An aperitivo was a Milanese thing. Um, it was snobbish. Uh, it was uh, uh, very much associated with looking down your nose at people from the South who would then go on to have a very large meal with, you know, in this kind of boisterous family atmosphere. And, uh, and that now, in, so that again, speaking of a super short time from when I was a teenager um, traveling to till now um, has, you know, completely changed so that um, anywhere, certainly Sorrento of all places, which is, you know, relatively chic uh, in uh, comparison to other uh, less sea adjacent places in the South, um, all would offer aperitivo uh, even even before lunch, but all, but certainly in the evening in that kind of seven to nine window, um, and would have a spritz available in particular, which was another thing that uh, you could have asked for, but would not have been served um, in uh, once you got south of the Po, really. So. <laughs> and. And Vicky, I'm curious, do you see that culture uh, in in Britain as well? We've oh, seen we such an explosion Britain. of that here. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, I mean, we've had, uh, as with America, you know, we've had waves of Italians uh, migrate here and have had um, a big influence um, on our restaurant culture. Um, you know, in Wales, for example, um, you know, Italians very quickly decided they weren't going down the, uh, the, the coal mines, they were going to stay above ground and have ice cream parlours and, and the cafes in, in Wales, for which they're famous. Um, and here in London, you know, we've, we've had the Italian CAF and they've kind of developed over the, you know, the last 50 years into sort of very chic operations. And so it was very natural to then adopt aperitivo and we, we're very um, um, diverse in our taste you know we, we don't really see the difference uh, as Brits between that and tapas and all that kind of whole grazing thing um, where you're eating for fun not necessity um, and you're doing it as a sort of 
a way of socializing. Um, it's very, very popular. And yeah, in fact, we have Zoom, meetings, Zoom parties where we're, sh you know, eating small bits <laughs> with our friends over Zoom. <laughs> um, and, you know, on, on the subject of aperitivo and, and digestivo, which Amari has really taken off in the United States as well in the last few years, there's something uh, about the Italian diet and the Italian way of eating that, to me, at least in my experience, has always felt very functional. Um, you have certain things for certain reasons. You know, you have a Negroni to stimulate the appetite. You have an Amaro after dinner to help you digest. Um, you know, I grew up in a family where we had salad after dinner. Um, and it, it blew my mind when I started going to restaurants and they were serving it initially because I was raised to believe that it was, it helped you digest after, after dinner. Um, so, and, and then there's, there's always this, you know, this idea of like taking a walk after a meal or, um, so I'm curious if anybody wants to speak a little bit towards the functionality of food or the, the health, the health sort of the consciousness among the, amongst the culture towards the functionality of food and, and sort of the health aspects. Um, I think, uh, that whole idea of herbal and that idea of foraging um, was very strong until recently. I think even in the 15 years that I've lived in Italy, um, it's actually died out. Um, the, the people used to do that a lot, that whole idea of, of um, food being also beneficial. Um, yeah, so I, as an, I wouldn't, as a British person, like to explain about different Italian habits on you know, how, uh, how health is cultural. Um, you know, and, and, um, so I'd, I would leave it to an Italian to explain. <laughs> uh, I guess I, I can pick up and say that, um, well, two things. One, <laughs> one, I never have any problem making um, offensive claims that will inevitably <laughs> have <laughs> Italians and Italian Americans coming at me. Um, so yeah, there's one side of it, which is I think there's a very uh, specific kind of British Italian uh, differentiation there where Americans sit somewhere in between in terms of um, health, because Italians will tell you that, you know, their liver hurts or their kidney hurts, or, um, you know, they have so they have such a profound connection with individual parts of their digestion, not just the uh, kind of way that we will say, you know, in American English, show oh, I have a stomach ache, right? But they'll say which specific organ and what part of the organ hurts, and then they will point to a moment, dietarily speaking, that was inevitably the culprit, right? Um, but uh, there is, you know, something to be said for the longer history there, because a lot of, you know, speaking of salad after dinner, for example, that's all that that is to some extent stemming back to um, not just, you know, what I look at in terms of um, medieval health and diet and food, but actually um, ancient and, and even, you know, pre, uh, pre Italic uh, and looking more at, at Greek and um, Near Eastern uh, Islamic influence there and the uh, understanding of balancing your intake and of foods having principles that are absorbed by the body and that the body then makes use of accordingly. Uh, and so things like lettuce were uh, cold and damp as you might just guess by looking at it, um, but we're considered to be sort of humorally, scientifically cold and damp. And so uh, you would necessarily balance the presence of items like that against hot and dry things. Uh, you would prepare the stomach for certain items so that it didn't become upset by the introduction of things that were harsh or, uh, or more complex to, to handle. Uh, and so while, um, you know, I think it's it's easy to make fun of things like this as pseudoscience, but all of our relationships with food uh, and diet are controlled by uh, something that's ultimately um, psychological and cultural, right? So it's um, it's just it's profoundly connected to where you come from and what you feel, as opposed to any real truth, because the real truth is that we don't know that much about our digestive systems, actually. Well, fortunately, I'll the, to I was going to say, fortunately, those customs happen to be delicious and really enjoyable um, as well. I think, um, Antonio, we have some questions from the audience. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Yes, we do. 
So we uh, well, uh, let's see here. What do we got? Um, some people submitted some questions as they were RSVPing, and I have just a few questions that I that I personally chosen um, to ask the group here. Okay, uh, this is uh, from Kathy. She wants to know where to buy a nana knife. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's the question for me. <laughs> I think so. Um, so <laughs> what I call a nana knife is a knife that you, which is incredibly cheap, and you can find at every farmer's. I mean, every ordinary market, not just a farmer's market. Any ordinary hardware store, any supermarket store, it is cheap. It is probably made in China these days. It has a, a blunt edge like the tip of your finger and it's serrated and it'll cost you about two or three euros a, a couple of dollars um and uh, the women that i film um use this knife for everything uh, they don't have chef's knives or anything like that this this knife is put through its paces whether it's chopping onions in your hand um you know it's 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 a remarkable thing and it's a demonstration that you don't need um, fancy tools to make great food Amazing, Steph. Do you have a nano knife? I I don't I know I don't know that I do. <laughs> cool. I don't know that I have something that would be that would fit exactly that description, but I should ask my nana. There you go. Um, so we have a question here from Patrick. It was pretty interesting. What are some signs that an Italian restaurant outside of Italy knows what they're doing? Who wants to field that? Allie, maybe. Is um, what I look for is if they have like proper aperitivo cocktails. Um, if they have aperitivo as a as a happy hour. Um, if gosh, I also look at the dessert menu to see if it's like over the top. Um, those, those are kind of the big indicators. Also for the pasta, if it's if it's overly complicated, um, if it just doesn't make sense, if things aren't seasonal, it's those are usually deal breakers. Anybody else have anything to add on that front? Oh, and the wine list. On the wine list. Yeah, look at the wine list um, and, and see who the producers are. Um, um, for me, it's like, is the menu short? Is, is, if it's overly complicated, it's probably not an Italian at the helm. Um, and uh, because I think that thing about, I think, um, I can't remember who was saying earlier about adding extra ingredients, take out the extra ingredients, um, keep it simple. It's just letting the ingredients speak for itself. Nothing saucy, you know, it's, it's about just letting those ingredients sing. And you should be able to tell that I don't know, just instincts. I hope it doesn't let you down. So. What if the restaurant has unlimited breadsticks and they have Frank Sinatra playing in the background? Is that, is that a pretty good <laughs> indication as a traditional Italian restaurant? Stay away. <laughs> Run. Um, how about this question here? How do, this is from Anna. How do Italians balance family and social life with work? It seems as if there's more time for longer meals and social gatherings. Um, I can talk, but I'm sure everybody else can too. I I just think um, that there's, in comparison to an American point of view or American experience, there's less pride taken in showing off how much you can work. Um, there's not, uh, I feel like there's a, a lot of uh, in terms of like the gear shift, um, I think Steph, you were you kind of opened with us talking about this, the idea of when you move, you know, you, everybody code switches when they go back and forth from two different cultures. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the distinctions is that there's a, a way of eating, but there's also just a way of living that's different. And um, I don't hear my time friends, um, you know, sort of making a point to let you know how early they got into the office, how they skipped lunch how they worked until really late, how they um, you know, didn't get to do the things they wanted to do. Um, they don't show off about the fact that they haven't taken vacation in two years. Um, there's, a real so there's a real social pressure in the US to 
um, not only not do those things, but to make sure other people know that you are replacing um, the pleasures in life with suffering. And uh, in Italy, people just take breaks sometimes. They work really hard. And by the way, there's a, a gross misinterpretation of, of that as, uh, as less work. Uh, it's just a different way of working. Um, Italians work very hard, um, often longer hours. So one of the first things I'll tell my students is that an average, you know, the what we call a nine to five in the U.S. is a nine to six in Italy because your hour lunch is not part of your eight-hour workday. It is assumed that you will, of course, take an hour lunch and enjoy a needed break in the middle of the day, but you will also put in a full day of work. Hmm. I also, uh, you know. From personal experience, the the um, the siesta in the middle of the day, and that's you know not exclusive to Italian culture, but um, I think that 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 break, first of all, and to Danielle's point, it doesn't mean that people are done working at that point. And in, in fact, they're they're going back to work when we're having dinner and and you know taking the night off. Um, but as far as things that I try to maintain when I come home, that is maybe number one and it's very hard to do in a, in a culture that expects you to be on 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 you know available by phone at three o'clock when i'm trying to take a nap but um i have found that to be such like an incredibly uh natural like it fits with the natural rhythms i feel like um in a way where you know i'm re i'm i'm very effective and productive when i first wake up in the morning um and so i get that twice if i do it you know the italian way i get that effective hour or two twice a day um if i take that moment to have lunch take a brief nap and then i get up and i have the same sort of like working potential that i do at eight in the morning which i always feel is you know really productive for me so that's why i can't get a hold of you at three o'clock i was gonna say assuming <laughs> that you have antonio uh you know to to grant you that, that <laughs> Um, one more question here. Oh, this is pretty fun. Uh, this is from Marta. What are some Italian breakfast traditions or habits that you want to recommend? So Italians, um, it's one of those the alien ones for me because they like sugar at breakfast. And I was always brought up on eggs and that whole idea, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that Italians love sugar so much in the Venetians in particular was it that they had the equivalent of gold Rolls Royces. They would they'd create sugar statues as a way of showing off in the 17th century or something. Is that right? And, and so they invented a meal, um, especially for sugary things. And eventually it ended up as breakfast, which is why Italians eat sugary things at breakfast. Is that a myth? <laughs> Just, <laughs> well, the sugar sculptures are, are part of uh, continental European fine dining or court dining, especially in the early modern period across the board, mostly just uh, general ostentation, um, but also, um, it, of course, dovetails with, with uh, colonial experiments and imperialism. So um, the availability of, of sugar widely is, uh, or not widely, I should say, readily um, is uh, a, a, a privilege, uh, heavily peppered with scare quotes here, obviously, of, um, of uh, imperial powers uh, who had uh, enslaved um, significant parts of the population and occupied um, the area that uh, we now know as the Caribbean and, uh, and beyond and, uh, and used that in order to have a cane sugar, which wouldn't have been available before that. S sugar as a taste was very exciting because sweetness was hard to achieve and nobody needs to know why sweetness was desired. We all still do it, right? We're, our bodies are desperate for sugar. It's fast energy and it tastes good. So um, I think now more than um, ever or more than anything, um, sugar in the morning is just perceived as a way to appropriately and sort of in a civilized adult way consume sugar because you know, you're not meant to have a lot of sugar or candy during the day, but you're allowed to have a cake in the morning because you have the whole day to work it off. So. I've actually had very different experiences while traveling in Italy. Um, growing up in the US, I feel like we think that sugar is a good idea in the morning with donut culture, with cereals, um, and, and obviously pastries. And 
when I had my first breakfast at an Egger Turismo in Piemonte, my mind was blown. And that was the first like food, the f- first culinary experience that shifted the way that I think. Um, and it was because it was so savory and it was all of the local cheeses and the meats. And yes, there was hazelnut um, pastries for sure. But overall, it was um, it was on the savory side of things. And I got a taste for the region and um, how local and special and how all of the fruit had been preserved from the summer months or whenever they were in season. And it's kind of like everything from that property was on the table for breakfast. And that was absolutely mind blowing. So I actually think that they're more savory, um, but I guess it depends where you're at. I think, I think agriturismo is um, designed for tourists. Um, and, and so I, I think that would be a special meal. Um, mm. um, um, but we need an Italian to join in on that one, I think. <laughs> um, I, my experience is that you kind of rush out for a very strong coffee, which you drink standing, and then you, you kind of go for it. You you're, you're kind of rush off uh, at sort of 50 miles an hour first thing, and then, you, you know, it's your espresso, no, no milk, absolutely nothing milky, and then, and then you'll have your, your cornetto, um, and on the go, kind of as you're leaving the bar, and and that's that's most Italians' breakfast. I'm, but, and so the, and so I'm always, I love coming across the agriturismos that you're talking about when it's actually got some cheeses on the table because that's that's more what I'm used to. Um, All right, so as we uh, wrap up here, how about we end with asking this question, which is uh, if for anybody that wants to start to dive into more uh, Italian culture or just kind of get their feet wet as far as like learning about it, what's uh, what's like a book, cookbook, or non-cookbook related uh, uh, book that you that each of you would recommend? I already know what Vicky's going to recommend uh, as far as the book um but maybe we could just end with uh <laughs> everyone recommending either a book um some other piece of literature or maybe um a documentary just like one thing to kind of have like a an introduction to italian culture or maybe it's just um not necessarily an introduction but something that really demonstrates um the culture in in in, in an educational manner start with you ali Well, I'd say first, if you do drink alcohol, to try a Chinar Spritz. I think they're not um, as widely served in restaurants, but it's like, um, it's my favorite. I'm a big pusher of Chinar Spritzes. Um, also, reverse martinis, because I love vermouth. But uh, as far as a book goes, I think that spritz is really cool because you can see the versatility um of different aperitivi um and i also really enjoy tasting room i think it has a really nice um mix of history and traditional roman culture which is incredibly special for food danielle what about you um, well, it's funny because you're asking and I'm, I'm looking behind me because I have, I'm in my new office, so I have <laughs> stacks of books all around me um, and a lot are in boxes still. So I'm trying to think of which ones are um, the most enjoyable to read. But I actually would say um, maybe better than um, reading a book or watching a film or anything that's, that's specifically about either food or about embracing Italian culture, it would be just to enjoy uh, something uh, that allows you to kind of enter that space and see how these things are present organically. So I, um, you know, I teach Dante and I'm about to start teaching my new Dante's Inferno class this fall. And one of the things that we talk about in reading Dante is food, um, clothes, 
politics, economics. So, so um, going, you know, these um, coming into that space allows you to approach these things in the way that would have been natural for someone coming from that culture also, right? And that is probably the, the best way to get enthusiastic about something because it doesn't feel forced. It's not about um, you being, you know, having someone shout at you, this is what you should know, but rather experiencing something. So, um, you know, any book at all, any film at all, uh, that you find interesting for any reason that allows you entry into the culture, I think is um, the best way to do it because it should feel natural to you and not like you have to sit down and do your homework. Absolutely. Vicky. I do have one that I would throw in the mix as well. Um, there's a book called La Passione, um, How Italy Seduced the World. And I really enjoyed this book. It's like, I think it's 10 or 12 chapters and each chapter is a different Part of the culture so there is a chapter on food but there's also a chapter on opera and italian cinema um and italian crafts and so it's not limited to food but it is very much uh it captures the the that that le that level of passion that italians um take and apply to every sort of endeavor um beyond beyond the culinary sphere so i, re I really enjoyed that book and i would recommend it what about you vicky what would you recommend that's not pasta grannies <laughs> um, I, I, picking up on the idea that you've got to find a passion and then, then sort of find out the Italian take on it um, is a good one. Um, so, of course, um, there's my book. Um, but I think if pasta is your thing, then everybody's reference is actually the Encyclopedia of Pasta, uh, which is a, a wonderful reference book full of um, very obscure pastas and um, the history behind them. Um, and it's an absolutely fascinating read amazing but definitely check out pasta grannies uh vicky's also featured in <laughs> yes. our uh latest life and time post the at home issue so we're really excited um and ali's uh, pasta guy is also featured in there too and you can also find it online and if you also want to learn more about italian culture we'll just go to lifeintime.com as well because we have a ton of stories on it, uh, uh, Italy and how they're dealing with the uh, uh, coronavirus, but then also we have a ton of recipes and, and just incredible content in there. Um, and yeah, that uh, concludes our webinar for today. We're really excited for, uh, for you to tune in for future webinars. And if you were only able to tune in to half of this or just a portion of it, we're also going to make this available on our website uh, on demand afterwards. So I'll give it like a day or so um and feel free to subscribe to our newsletter at lifeintime.com for um getting any news on uh, uh upcoming webinars these are completely free like i said and they're supported by our life and time members so please consider joining as a as a member that's you know we're completely ad free and independent so um we rely on our members for editorial sustainability and to do fun stuff like this all right guys Thank you so much for tuning in and uh, happy pasta making. Ciao, ciao. Happy bye bye. Making.